So the summary then of what we have to account for when we account for glaciations is we must account for their rarity in the geological record and their apparently sporadic occurrence, this great gap of 300 million years before our present glaciation, for example. We have to account for that. In other words, a long-term change of some kind. Then we also have to account for those relatively short-term changes of hundreds of thousands of years that we found when we looked at the pattern of glaciation within our own last ice age. The advance and the retreat, the advance, retreat, advance again and so forth. We must account for those changes. Now, there have been many theories put forward to account for them. Let's, let's begin with the relatively short-term changes. What sort of things might affect or might produce short-term changes in the climate of the Earth? Well, one of the areas of speculation has to do with the position of the Earth relative to the Sun. That's in this model. See the Sun here and this the Earth. Now the Earth moves around the Sun in this kind of fashion. With the axis of rotation of the Earth pointing toward the Sun, if you like. This is the axis of rotation like that. So, for example, the North Pole receives sunlight for 24 hours during the winter when the top of the Earth, if you like, the north part of the Earth, is pointing toward the Sun. So that's, in, in simple terms, the position of the Earth as it goes around the Sun. An inclined axis and going around the Sun in a circle. You can see the same thing on this diagram here. This, the Earth with the tilted axis, and this the summer situation with rays from the sun illuminating the North Pole 24 hours a day. And the Earth then through the seasons, through fall and through winter, moves around the sun. In the winter situation, the North Pole is in darkness for 24 hours a day as the Earth rotates on its inclined axis. And then in the spring situation, back to summer. Now, if that were the simple picture, the simple rotation of the Earth around the sun, and that were constant, then everything would be easy. But it doesn't stay constant. The orientation of the Earth toward the sun and the position of the Earth toward the sun change. One of the major changes is an alteration in the orientation of the axis of the Earth, the axis around which the Earth rotates. We can see that in this diagram. The axis of the Earth, that is the south to north poles, presently points to the North Star. But just like a wobbling top, every 13,000 years, the axis of the Earth changes and points an equal amount in the opposite direction. And this would be the North Star in 13,000 years' time. And 13,000 years after that, the situation would be back to normal. So on the simple situation that we looked at first, with summer here in the Northern Hemisphere in June, in 13,000 years with the axis in the opposite direction, we'd have winter in June. Now, those, or that is, one major change in the orientation of the Earth. There's a second change which takes place, and that has to do also with the axis of rotation of the Earth, but has to do with the angle of the axis of rotation. The maximum angle is 24 and a half degrees from what would be a vertical north-south, and the minimum is 21 and a half degrees. The angle at present is tilted about 23 and a half degrees. And that change from a maximum to a minimum takes place about every 20,000 years. 
Now the importance of those changes in position is that the summers need to be cold in order for the snow which fell during the winter not to melt and to have a chance to build up to form an ice sheet. And those two circumstances plus another one combine to produce the cold summers that we need for the advance of glaciers. That other change in position of the Earth is that the Earth doesn't in fact go around the Sun in a perfect circle. The Sun is not at the center of the orbit uh, of the Earth. There's a long axis at present of 94 and a half million miles and that occurs during our summer and there's a short axis of about 91 and a half million miles. So the Earth's orbit is eccentric and it becomes even more eccentric than it is at present about every 92,000 years. And moreover, the long axis becomes the short axis of the eccentric orbit every 108,000 years. Now that all sounds very complicated and it's difficult to remember the figures and just what's going on. But the sum total that we want in order to produce a cool summer in the northern hemisphere in order for the summer snow, or for the summer not to melt the winter snow, is we need the summer to be when the Earth is far from the sun. We need it, the axis, to have a small inclination toward the, toward the sun. And at that stage, the summers will be cool, and we'll have a chance to preserve the winter snow. So, one can calculate how often those circumstances are likely to occur. And a mathematician called Milankovitch did exactly that. And there seems to be some correspondence between the times when those favorable circumstances for preservation of snow during the summer in the northern hemisphere, some coincidence to the actual observed advances of the ice during our last ice age. Now, there's much disagreement about this. It depends on dating of the advances. It depends on calculations and so forth. But there seems to be some agreement. And we may, in the position and the orientation of the Earth vis-a-vis -vis the Sun, have some reason or some cause for major climatic changes, the kinds of climatic changes we want to occur on the 10 or the 100,000 year scale. But we have a problem with the long-term changes. And in order to solve the problem with the long-term changes, we have to look at the distribution of the oceans and the continents. At the South Pole, the continent of Antarctica, which is glaciated, lies in an interesting position. It's right over the pole. There is the outline of the continent of Antarctica, covered by two miles of ice.